I was out evangelizing yesterday and the Lord was talking to me about um, pride, actually. <laughs> he was talking to me about the unsaved. Yesterday, I was ministering to a man and you know, one of the things that's very important for someone to receive Christ is that they understand that they need to actually turn from the ways, from the path that they're on. Their heart needs to turn. Once their heart turns, the, the Bible says that when one um, turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So their heart needs to have a, a transformation. Only Holy Spirit can do that, convict someone's heart. Not condemn them, but convict them of their own sins so that they're convicted of their right standing with God. But their heart needs to turn in order for, you know, they need to actually choose to do that. And that can only happen if someone understands that the path that they're walking on is actually separate from God, that they're not right with Him. And so yesterday I was discussing with this man, like talking about sin, and I asked him, like, do you have sin? And he said to me, no. And I said, well, I, I have so much sin. My sin would be heavy. And this man blatantly said, oh, well, what you call sin, I would not call sin. But sin is doing anything disobedient to what God's Word says. Amen? Amen. And so this man, like, in that moment, the Lord spoke to me about pride. Because many people, I evangelize to a lot of people, many people think, because I've done good deeds, therefore I'm good. Many people think, because, you know, I've spent my life trying to be a good person, that that's going to get them into heaven. But let me tell you, someone could think that they're doing the right thing or that they're doing God a favor, but they're really not because it's the ego. And so I'm going to go to Acts 9, and this is talking about Paul. Then Saul, uh, verse 1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anywhere, anyone who are of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, Paul thought that he was doing God a favor by persecuting Christians who were so high and mighty. As the journey came near to Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And what that actually means is with the oxen, you know, the, um, they'd have a, a prodder. And when the oxen were treading grain or treading out the, the the plowing, and um, they would prod them, and they would kick against the goads. That's what a goad was. It was a, like a prodder, and they'd kick buck against it. And that's what Jesus was saying to him, like, it's hard for you to kick against me. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You see, Saul thought that he was doing something right. He thought he was helping God by persecuting Christians. He thought that he was in the right. You know, this is an extreme version or extreme example of someone that they thought that they were doing the right thing. They thought that this was the way to heaven by very alarmingly persecuting the very people that God had sent potentially into his life to be an example of who Christ actually really is. But he was murdering them because his own ego said, I'm doing God a favor. I'm higher, higher, I'm mightier, I know the law, I'm righteous. So therefore, I'm going to wipe out these people. And that was what Paul's attitude was. There are many people that think they're doing the right thing or doing God a favor or being high and mighty by being good. And they're not because they don't have right standing with God. And so this is a very extreme example, but I think Saul's um, testimony is so profound because God kicked him off his high horse and he saw the light 
And God himself confronted him. Why are you kicking against me? This is not bringing you any sense of reality of fulfillment. But then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So Saul had come off the horse and he had totally lost his eyesight. Now the next part of it is very interesting. And I think the Lord does this for us at times as well. He gives us a direction to go somewhere and then he says, well, when you get there, I'm going to tell you or I'm ex- going to explain to you what to do. And I feel like a lot of us, God's given us some direction even at the moment. And maybe you don't see what's on the other side, but through your obedience that God's going to give you the word or the knowledge or the wisdom to know what to do when you get there. Verse 12, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he has chosen a vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, Paul had a radical conversion. He was thrown off that horse. And on the other side of that, God was going to use him to preach the gospel. But it wasn't that he was going to be unscathed in that next chapter of life. But it was actually that he had to push through because there were many times that he was brutally bruised, he was beaten, he had suffered. He was the one person in the Bible, and I believe that suffered with endurance to see God's kingdom manifest on the earth. Verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has come, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food and he was strengthened, then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. You see, there are some people that are very unlikely that they'll receive Jesus. But when they receive Jesus, the conversion is so radical. And the Lord's just reminding me at the woman at the well and how God radically trans, she, he, her whole life was turned in a different way. She ended up being an evangelist, a woman that was so ingrained in the world. And she went out and said, let me tell you about a man that told me everything that I ever did. And I think that God, He does this in His nature. And I feel like God wants to actually save the people that are, yes, persecuting Him, but their own ego, their own ego. God wants to demolish that ego so that people would say, you know, I was once blind, but now I see. Immediately He preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is a son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and, it, and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. You see, Paul knew that the religious wanted to kill him, but he still got up and did it anyway. Now, I think there's a lot of metaphor in this because in this uh, day and age, there's persecution against the saints. And I know that Paul stood there in the midst of adversity and he still witnessed, he still professed, he still spoke to the religious And I believe that that's how God wants to use us in this hour. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. 
I want to go back to verse 15. It says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, when we're ruling and reigning with Christ, it does not come without suffering. It does not come without discomfort. It does not come without, you know, the devil tries to, as I said before, he tries to steal our intimacy, which is trying to steal the presence of God. And he tries to steal our authority. But let me tell you, the name of Jesus is higher than above any other name. And Paul, Paul's life, when I look at his whole life, he brought the confrontational nature of the gospel and he never stopped and he never quit. This is Galatians 1, verse 11 to 12. Paul's saying, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, we don't preach a gospel that we haven't understood. We preach a gospel that we received through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. We don't come with those wise and persuasive words, but an actual demonstration of power. You know, so that people's faith is not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. In Philippians 3.10, Paul is saying that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And I remember Paul saying, it's better for me that I go, meaning it's better for me that I go to the Father, but it's better for you that I stay. He, he even knew. He wanted to go to the Father, but he knew it was better for, for him, better for you rather, that he would stay. So he could impart something, so that he could actually not only just preach the gospel, yes, preach the gospel, yes, save souls, but also bring a confrontational shaking against the principalities and powers and high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God.